morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone? So, thank you, thank you. So today, guys, is a very special day for us. We are 13 years old, so wishing us a happy 13th anniversary. Yes, yes. So, um, I would like to welcome everyone here today. You guys look wonderful. Also, our social media community. We, we have a very, very strong, very committed social media group in uh, our cyber uh, space family members. We love you all. I want to read our mission statement here, and this is what we are about. We are a strong, open, globally connected community centered on the clarity of principle through teaching, service, and practice. We create a safe and respectful environment that supports healthy spiritual growth. That is who we are. And as a result of us turning 13, we will be having our membership meeting directly after the service, and each and every one of you are invited to participate and, of course, be with us. I want to give a shout out to our special guest, Dr. Bob, is here to join us. And again, this makes the 13th anniversary just that more special because under his leadership, we were able to make it to 13. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Today, um, we, we have a um, special guest speaker, Reverend Susan Zoller, and the theme for the month is that's how we never done it. Reverend Susan Zoller is a perfect example of that's how we never done it. She's demonstrated this throughout her life. And guys, it's always a fun time being with Reverend Susan Zoller, being around Reverend Susan Zoller. And today, her topic is living in wholeness. Living in wholeness. I like the way that sounds, Reverend Susan. Living in wholeness. Quick story. Um, going to be abbreviated today simply because we have the um, membership meeting directly after. The lesson that I learned coming here, most of you know, I grew up as a Catholic, conditioned as a Catholic, but in that teaching, it was a right or wrong, never about the wholeness. But when I took the classes here and learned about that principle of wholeness, it taught me there was no side to pick. And if I'm picking a side, that means I'm making myself a victim. And of course, that is the only way any of us can become a victim. We make the choice to be that victim. Today, guys, I want to say thank you to each of you because it is because of you we are 13 years old. So we exist because of you. We like hearing from you. We want to hear from you. And keep in mind, all of us together have created this wonderful, beautiful experience that we are having today. So I want you all, uh, people in Cyberland, as well as the people here, please give yourself a hand. We absolutely do appreciate you. So I want to go into a treatment. My treatment is on the oneness. And I will do the treatment in the first person. And of course, follow your inner voice that will lead and guide you 
along your journey. Uh, before that, I just want to leave you with this message. Don't let others tell you about yourself. Living in the oneness is how you know and understand who you are. And as we center ourselves around the oneness, we come to know and understand there is but the oneness, the universe in and of itself, the source from which all is made. I being of the oneness of the universe, of the magnificent, I too am manifested by the oneness. And it is this oneness that I come to know who I am. And it is my knowing of this oneness that creates my experiences in life. It is this knowing of the oneness. As a co-creator, I co-create the experiences that I am having in my life. It is the choices that I make that brings into my life my experiences. I cannot blame any others other than the choices that I get to make. It is the knowledge of this oneness, of this source, of the universe in and of itself, and my relation to the universe that I get to make the choices for my life. And for this knowledge of the oneness, of my relationship to the oneness, I am grateful. And so it is. So now we will have reflective music. Before that, yes, we have a declaration, guys. So our declaration goes, I believe in one God, one absolute power and first cause to all things. I believe that this power is perfect love and it creates out of a desire to express love. I believe all thought is creative and how I choose to think creates my personal experience. I believe in the unity of all life and the immortality of the individual soul forever unfolding. I believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givenness of God to all. Guys, what a beautiful song. I start my day, and you get to decide what is it you start your day with. Karen Druck is one of our favorites. We absolutely love her. And of course, you just heard the song, I start my day with, and again, you get to choose. So our speaker comes to uh, today is Reverend Susan Zoller. She's originally from Louisiana. Susan has lived in Atlanta since 1977 with time out in 95 and 96 to serve as the minister of the Center for Spiritual Living in Maui. She taught biology, chemistry, physics in Gwinnett and Cobb County. Life changed for Susan when she first attended the Atlanta Church of Religious Science in 1985 and heard Dr. Ken Schultz speak. This sparked a lifelong study of and dedication to religious science. A staff minister to SCLA, she lives with her wife of 25 years and their two dogs. And now guys, I invite you all to create your relationship with the one and only Reverend Susan Zoller. Yes. July 4th, 1862 was described as a golden afternoon. 
The place is the ice is better known as the Thames River. And the participants in this afternoon's experience are two men. One was a minister and one was Charles Dobson, a teacher at Oxford University, and three young sisters aged 13, 10, and 8, whose parents were not present. The occasion is a repeat of an 1856 uh, earlier five-mile trip, and the details are that the daughters who were there, the sisters, were daughters of Dodgson's neighbor, the Liddells, who told them stories as they rode up the river. And Dodgson also, interestingly enough, kept an extensive portrait collection of very young girls, the first of whom was uh, he, he had ever taken was of the second daughter, Addis Liddell. Now, so we'll have the record straight for what happened. Alice's mother burned correspondence later on between Charles Dodgson and her daughter Alice. And Dodson's relatives actually burned and tore up. They deleted every bit of his diaries that were about that period of time in his life. Now, given the circumstances and the times we're in, what thoughts come to you when you hear that description? Uh, I have a bunch. But the... the, the, the Bleh, I can speak. The adults on that golden afternoon were Reverend uh, Robinson Duckworth and the mathematics professor, Oxford University Don, Charles Dodson, who I mentioned earlier, who were entrusted with the children of his neighbor and friend, Henry Liddell. And the journey first happened, as I said, in 1856. And on these journeys, both times, Liddell told them fascinating stories, just took them, you know, into his imagination. And the golden afternoon referenced here is six years after the first one. And what's significant about that day is, uh, other than the good company, of course, is a story told about a girl who was inspired by that second daughter that he had taken pictures of, Alice. And Alice loved this particular story so much that she asked Dodson if he would write it down. He didn't wait. He started writing the next day. And more than two years later, she received a manuscript from him titled Alice's Adventures Underground. It was written under the pen name, maybe you'll know this one, Lewis Carroll. And we know it today as Alice in Wonderland. And it was an instant classic when it was published in 1865. Now, what does this story have to do with living and wholeness, really, now? Uh, well, it's Alice's adventures after she fell down a rabbit hole. You can see his creativity. Now, I have heard and been told that the wholeness of our life is based on the choices that we make. And the changes we choose in life are based on the stories that we tell ourselves. And the truth of wholeness, it is a spiritual truth, capital T, that we're actually whole and complete. There's nothing wrong with us, and we have everything we need to create a fabulous life. Now, being a former teacher, we have a definition. What is wholeness? By definition, it is, this, I'll read this so I make it say it right, the state or condition of not broken, injured, or damaged it is an intact condition. Second one, soundness, health, or well-being in mind, body, soul, or spirit. Now, each of us, as you believe, I guess, today by being here, we are a creature of the Most High. We are created with the Spirit's characteristics. We're intelligent. We're powerful. We're creative. And actually, no matter what's happened, we are intact and uneven uninjured yes. absolutely and we're healthy and we have unlimited access to the divine mind we have opportunities to take part in all of the possibilities in the creative mind which we may call god or allah or whatever name spirit 
divine mind. And that mind is always corresponding to our thoughts, feelings, emotions, and beliefs. And that is, and I always say this, even if we don't realize we believe it. I've caught myself in a lot of things I didn't realize I believed that I was manifesting. Now, through prayer, we direct. We do not control. That is important. We do not control the events of our life. But the nature of our lives is not changed by the things that we experience. Not the true nature, not in spirit, not in truth, capital T is in spiritual truth. We're whole. Yet how many of us are in Alice's Wonderland? Absolutely what I call down the ro rabbit hole, wholeness with an H, H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. You know, take away the letter W and what a difference a consonant makes from spiritual wholeness to wholeness like you done fell down a hole. Absolutely. Now, Alice follows a white rabbit that ought to tell you something right there and falls into another dimension where the character flaws and problems dominate everything. The belief system is really... Uh, is something else, and it colors every aspect of the story. So are we living from wholeness with a W or wholeness with an H? You know, because the consonant doesn't, well, isn't really what makes the difference. It's what we think of when we think of those words. Absolutely. You know, do we see ourselves as whole or do we see ourselves as like Alice doesn't go on down that hole again? You know, it's the belief system that really matters. And physics teaches us, you've probably heard me say this before, maybe a little tired of it, that we put out energy when we think and feel and believe, and it comes back to us, goes out into the ethers, and the spirit, the divine mind, responds to it and sends it accordingly back to us. You know, we may not realize that it's coming back to us directly, if we think about a baby, that doesn't mean immediately that one is going to pop into our lives. But, you know, what we focus in to, you know, on comes back to us. Spirit is always responding. And as I said earlier, our power really comes from our ability to make choices. We all make choices. We've made a ton of them today already. It, but the fact is, it matters what we choose. You may think, oh, that's so inconsequential. But when it adds up, all the little thoughts, it really does matter. And you may be thinking, well, Susan, you know, you kind of got one story, but you know, you don't know my family. You don't know my background. You don't know the church I was tortured with when I was young, whatever. You know, um, that's true. Control over the actions of others and our genetics and our cultural background affect us, but they do not control us. We in this room are adults, and at a certain age, no matter what somebody tries to make you think, you don't have to believe it. You can think of things as a child you were told to believe, and you didn't believe it. Did any of you believe you are going to burn a fiery pit of you know, hell with the devil dancing around and red with a pitchfork? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But I know people who said, I just don't believe God would do that to me. Just depends. You know, but in wholeness, every interaction and situation is seen as perfect possibility. You don't think, oh my God, I got myself in a situation. It's a choice. You can choose to think in this situation, what can I do that is going to lead me to where I want to be? What can I do that is going to change my energetic pattern that I project out to the universe that comes back to me as my circumstances? Because it's a choice what we think, even if we don't realize it. And we can trust our inner guidance, our intuition to tell us. When we learn how to do it, we have to practice a bit. What's our ego or our, our active mind thinking? And what's our inner truth telling us? Have y'all ever realized you were in your ego rather than your truth? I haven't, but I've heard of people who have, and uh, I, I really think that it's, it's sad for them. But um, actually, I've done it a whole lot. 
And while it may not feel like it at the time, we do have a choice of responding or reacting. Responding or reacting. Reacting is often a quick uh, decision. It may be highly based in emotion. It's impulsive and it's not usually based on a lot of thought. But responding, on the other hand, where you take in your circumstances, you take in uh, the results of actions you can have. You know, some of you, somebody may come up and say something and you just pop off right there. Maybe there's an explosion close to you and you react. Well, reaction has a place in our lives. It keeps us safe. If we didn't react to certain things, it's likely that a lot of us might not be here today because we didn't react in time to a potentially dangerous situation. But, you know, if we do that all the time, it is not healthy. It's not constructive, and it's actually sometimes really destructive. You know, one sign of maturity is the ability to be able to think about the consequences and possible outcomes of our thoughts and actions. When you were a child and somebody said, Katie, you might have one reaction. Today you might think, mm, I don't want to eat all that sugar, you know, or you may just still go gobble down a handful of M&Ms. I don't know. But it's a choice. We can teach ourselves to choose, even when we don't think we can, because our brain is elastic and it is always able to change much later in life than we ever thought possible. So we can learn to think and, and believe and do things differently. I don't care what somebody tells you, I can't teach an old dog new tricks. You haven't known some of the old dogs I've known if you believe that. You know, I'm going to share two examples with you of how things change for me very quickly in interactions with other people. One, I was with my friend, Roxanne, we were having breakfast to discuss a possible meeting coming up. And she told me about this women's workshop she went to. And it was very private and very safe environment. And there was one exercise where there was a big mirror, big, big mirror there. And each woman was to get up, take off her clothes, walk to the mirror, look at it, and say what she didn't like about herself. And this woman got up who looked like her twin. She said it's a real doppelganger uh, experience to look at this woman. The woman walked up to the mirror, stood there for a minute, looked at it, said, I don't like my nose, and sat down. Roxanne thought, what is this? There's so much more to criticize. I mean, really, look at all my flaws. And she's got them too. We're like twins. That woman didn't see herself that way. It was a choice. Certainly influenced by her background, her family, other experiences. But still, it's a choice. It is absolutely a choice. So the second story is about a friend of mine who was a minister for a long time, Camille Morgan. Some of you may have known her. And Camille and I were riding in her car over at North Lake Mall some years back. And this woman pulled right out in front of us, almost took her bumper off. And with my uh, mode of thinking that time, I thought some unkind thoughts, just a few, but very energetic, I shall say, about this woman. And all Camille did was say, you know, people like that I call Maud. What? I call them Maud, and you can't get mad at Mauds for the way they drive because they're just a Maud. You just have to watch out for them. What a difference a Camille made in that moment because, you know, my reaction would have been to be angry, to have said unkind thoughts, even if it was just in my head. I was going to go down the rabbit hole with Alice, but, you know, she didn't. It really was a lesson to me about how we can choose what frustrates us. If you see somebody and they get so angry, a friend of mine said, that person was looking at me because I didn't take my buggy back to the to the uh, grocery store. I said, so? Well, they were judging me and I got really angry. You don't have to get mad because they looked at you. It's a choice. But, you know, if you look at Lewis Carroll, he was shy, he was awkward, but with children, he was totally different. And with his students, 
He was outgoing. He was funny. He was engaging. But, you know, um, with adults or people near his own uh, age, he was called old maid primness. Uh, the, she was so prim and proper with the others. It was a real distinct difference. And studies have suggested that Carol had split personality disorder. You know, he revealed his alternative self in these fantastic stories like Alice in Wonderland, Alice Through the Looking Glass, where everything is so different from our world. And he said, uh, it shows the two sides of him. The boyish Mr. Uh, Mr. Carroll was, boy, I'll read this, whimsical, eager, reciprocal, social, fond of recognition, intensely humorous, but Professor Dodgson, on the other hand, serious, donnish, mature, shy, aloof, egotistical, easily offended, and having very little interest in other people. Now, uh, this description of Carol uh, is not mere speculation. They recorded his actions. He stuttered. He was overly possessive of his belongings. He kept an obsessively organized record of everything he did. I don't think you probably recognize yourself in this. He suffered from insomnia and he was depressed for most of his life. But in spite of all this, his mind created a classic, an absolute classic worldwide that has been seen and read and talked about by untold numbers. Now, what wholeness with the W traits did Lewis Carroll have that made him able to do this? I picked out a few. First, he created situations where he uh, felt free to express his creativity. In other words, he nourished his creativity and he shared it with a receptive audience. That's a big point, a receptive audience. How would it be if you shared a story and everybody went, oh, um, what are you telling me this for? You get a totally different feeling, but he chose receptive audience. And when it was suggested he put his story to paper, he didn't start you know, hemming and hawing, thinking about how hard it was going to be or did he have enough paper or ink or what was he going to do? He just started writing it the next day. You know, he didn't wait until he got to be shy no longer. He didn't wait till he acquired a fortune to do this. He simply started expressing his creativity within. And it was suggested that he write. He began immediately, and he did so to satisfy that creative urge within himself. Absolutely. He did not wait to better himself or for any shifts to occur, i.e., he just did it. And I'm sure that it, everything he wrote was not what he chose to put in the long run. But, you know, that's what editing is for. Third thing, he allowed his imagination to absolutely run free. He trusted his process. He allowed his ideas to incubate and to emerge. Absolutely. What a difference. And fourth, he did not accept the actions of others that might impede his process of bringing the story to fruition. The earliest version of his story was lost. So he wrote an even longer version of Alice. The Tea Party was included in the second version. You know, opinions that differed from his did not stop him. He took his biggest challenges and made them his greatest assets. That's important. He took his biggest challenges and made them his greatest assets. He illustrated the book himself, but he had an editor who suggested to him that he get a professional illustrator. And he followed the advice, and it really improved the book. So he, know, he knew when he got good advice, and he knew when to follow it. He didn't insist, oh, I wrote this book, these are my drawings, this is the way it's going to be. No. You know, he invested his time, his energy, his money, and where attention goes, energy flows. How much time do you spend thinking about things you want to create versus all the reasons why you can't create it? Really. Because all thought is creative, and his focused thought 
produced this masterpiece, a classic. He believed in his success and he knew the book as complete and successful, even though he wrote it for a little girl. What is it about you and I uh, when we're investing in our desires as Lewis Carroll did? Where do we go? Where do we go in the thought? Is there an impulse within you to do something? Something you've always kind of wanted to do, but you, you know, mm, but that idea invigorates you. It makes you feel alive. And when you get those kind of feelings, do you respond or react? Really? Knowing the strong effect of the thoughts we choose to focus upon, do we recognize the thoughts that are surrounding our impulse? Do we recognize the thoughts that come to us so fast we don't even realize it, that we think about ourselves? How often has an idea come to me or to you and we immediately rejected it? That's really important. It happens so fast we may not realize it. You know, think of the word react. Think of a time you reacted to something. Think of the word respond. Think of the time you responded and how that felt. Think of something you wanted to do for a really long time, but you haven't done it. How does it feel when you think about that? This is something that you can ponder when you're on your own, at home, alone. You don't have to have anybody else's input because we can trust the wisdom within us. Just breathe and notice your thoughts. Even if you have to sit there for a few minutes or a long time, just sit there and just realize, don't try to control it. What goes through your mind? You know, notice if there are smells or textures or a temperature, or a scent, whatever. And realize while you're doing that how you feel. Stories we tell ourselves. How many times did I hear my family sit around and tell stories that had a negative outcome about someone we knew, most particularly a relative or two? Really. How they focused on how that person was just not up to snuff. But you know, they got more of that behavior from that person. That's what they put out there, and that's what they got back. You know, bring someone to mind that you admire. If they had that impulse that you have, what would they do? I have a friend of mine, Brenda, who is so creative, who is so accomplished, who is so directed. When I think of the things I've done in my life, there's this much. When I think of all things that she's accomplished, it's this much. Because she says, okay, that's a good idea. And she does it. She may meet with differing levels of success. But the thing is, she does it. You know, when you think of your idea, are you going down the rabbit hole? Or are you thinking of your own wholeness? And that's an important thing to think. You know, what would it take to immerse yourself in that wholeness? To activate the perfect potential because spirit is always responding. We have an idea how it happens. We can't totally say how it happens, but it happens. So it's good to choose what we want to focus on. And you may say, I can't help it. There, that lady pulled right out in front of me in the parking lot. I don't care if you call her Maud or Susie or stupid. Uh, I just can't stop. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Think of something else. Go Have an idea in your head when you start getting really upset of something that's really happy for you. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a spouse. A memory that's very precious to you. Whatever it is. Think of something and realize you can do what we in education call changing your state. You can. You absolutely can. You know, at perfect times, I've been a perfect, bad example of how to use science of mind. I'm serious. You'd think I'd never heard of it. But, you know, the fact is, 
That was my level of consciousness then. When I started learning that I could change things, I did, and it took off like a rocket. You know, Carol was an excellent teacher. He was appreciated by his students. They thought he was fabulous, but you know, he's described by others as awkward, shy, eccentric. He had a womanly face that did not show strength, but when he shook your hand, it was very firm. You know, but his movements were jerky and abrupt, and at times he stuttered so much that people couldn't understand him. And his behavior and the things I've described to you that he already did, we probably here in this 21st century would be very uncomfortable with. I don't think I'd let him take any children I was in charge of out knowing his predilection for young girls. He, they thought he had dissociative identity disorder, split personality, multiple personality. There was such a difference between Lewis Carroll and Professor Dodgson. You know, you can look at it and there's, there's down the rabbit wholeness. You can focus on his flaws, his thoughts, his actions, what we might call race consciousness. But there's another view of spiritual wholeness. And that's the genius creative mind that out of all those things came this book that has never been out of publication. You know, he was beloved by children and adults, and Queen Victoria was an avid reader of his book, and I don't know whether this says anything, so was Oscar Wilde. But consider this, Alice's story has never been out of print. It was translated into 174 languages in more than 100 editions. It was presented in three different uh, musicals, two operas, a ballet, and more than 26 television and film productions. No matter what he may have had as what we see a flaw, he was a success. He's not angelic. Absolutely not. You know, but as an adult, Alice always spoke highly of him, although a lot of people didn't. So remember this, poor choices on your behalf do not define you. They may affect you, but you can turn that around the moment you decide to focus on your wholeness and come from there. Come from your truth within you, not your ego. Ego goes here and there and here and there. Truth is quiet, it is strong, and it comes to you in different ways than you may ever expect. You know, spirit is responding every minute. So ask yourself, what stories are you telling yourself? And from these stories, how do you see the world? How do I see the world? Am I living from wholeness or someone that I view as incomplete, broken, or fragmented? Let's see ourselves as God sees us, perfect, whole, complete, perfect possibility in every moment. And with all the chaos in the world today, please know that you and I have the ability to change the world one thought at a time, one action at a time, one moment after moment that adds up to a whole lifetime. There's perfect possibility in any moment. No matter what you call God, spirit, divine mind, Allah, whatever. It is always responding and creating according to how we believe. And shifting our stories can create experiences that we have previously unimagined and bring wonderful changes to my life. So it worked in my life, and I know it can in yours. It didn't magically happen. No, it was a learning process that got altered by attending classes and working with practitioners and reading. So should you have challenges believing uh, that you are perfect whole and you need assistance, there's a minister or two here today. There's practitioners who are there to support you. Go to them. It's confidential. We who have trained ourselves in this are here to remind you of the truth of your being, your divine nature. To paraphrase what a client told me, and I will certainly paraphrase, this stuff works. Because the truth is wonderful, and so are you, and so am I. Namaste.
Aloha, blessed be, shalom, amen. And so it is. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you, Reverend Susan. An awesome talk yes. and analogy um, with that story of who we are, the, what we can do with our lives. So with that, it's our time to give to the center. Um, if you're here in the room, there's envelopes on the end of the table. There's a basket in the back of the room. For those of you online, we've got a QR code that'll pop up. You can go to cslmidtown.org slash donate. That'll take you right to the donation site. Um, and if you will, stay with me, our affirmation of prosperity. I live, live in, in a universe, universe of abundance, abundance as, as I, I freely and joyfully give. give. I join in the divine flow, and all that I share with life returns to me, multiplied abundantly, and so it is. And I'm going to turn it over to our board president, Lee Huffman, for announcements. Thank you, man. So, um, get down here. <laughs> I, um, the... Big things that we have going on is the meeting right after this, and um, that's between us and lunch. So we're gonna. We thought we were gonna try and make it real quick, but it's uh, when we start looking at everything that's presented, it's not a twenty-minute talk. It's um, a bit more than that. Uh, so we're glad everybody's here. And for those of you online, uh, we would like for you to go out, get online through Zoom because this will be going down, and um, you can do that by going to cslmidtown.org and scrolling down to where it says Zoom and note the code um, to get in and then click on the Zoom button and it'll bring you in to that talk. Uh, the other things that we have is next uh, Sunday, we have the adult study group um, that is meeting from 10 o'clock to uh, 10.50 every Sunday. And that's a great talk. I appreciate the practitioners doing that. Uh, we also have the Tuesday uh, talk um, that is open to anyone that comes in, and that's from 12 to 12:30. Again, the same Zoom for both of those meetings, and then we have a call online or a meeting online um, next uh, Sunday from 11 to 12. So uh, please uh, stay with us, uh, get on Zoom, and be ready for the next meeting. So, anything else, Vance? Okay. <laughs> yes, and the affirmation. I want to make sure I made all the announcements today. So join me with this. I believe I leave this place now knowing something better than I knew before. I go forth in the world with a heart full of love and a mind full of good sense. I look at the world in a greater way, knowing that I have within me everything I need to create the life I desire. I give thanks for this understanding, and I am grateful for the spirit of life that lives through me, and so it is. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it.